gospel is an old English word, and it means good news. The gospel is an account describing the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This, right here, us standing in front of you, is a gospel. Because the good news that Jesus has brought to us never ended on the cross. The gospel is being continued by all of us, every day. <laughs> Who is Jesus? I'm certain every Sunday school kid here can give me the perfect answer to that question because they are all exceptional students, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ was born, lived, died, and got resurrected. He was born as God's only Son. He lived as an inspiration to all of us. He died for the forgiveness of sins and he got resurrected for... Um, to prove God's eternal life, right? That's what Sunday School has taught me. The more important question for today and now, though, is who is Jesus Christ to you? And you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Because if I know one thing for sure, it's that Jesus was born, died, lived, and got resurrected for all of us. And that our religion is a personal one. The variety of answers that I received to this question from congregation members, who is Jesus Christ to you, definitely showed one thing. Jesus Christ has many, many faces. We had a soccer game, and we played a really good team. I was the goalie. In the second half of the game, the other team fired a shot at my goal. It was a hard kick, and I couldn't reach with my hands. But the wind picked it up, and it just hit the top bar. The ball bounced off, and the striker came running for a second try. He shot again, and for a second time, the ball hit the top bar. Once again, it bounced off into the box, and the striker tried for a third time to get the ball into the net. He shot, but the ball went way over the goal. I went to the store because I suddenly had an intense craving for Reese's peanut butter chocolate. When I waited in line, there was this lady in front of me with a bunch of different stuff. It took the cashier a while to scan all her items. Plus, she had a, to comment on every single item. So I waited a long while. She didn't notice me at first, but as she was looking through her purse for her wallet, she turned around and saw me. Immediately, she apologized and saw that I only had three Reese's in my hand and offered to pay for me. Of course, I rejected at first, saying that I didn't mind waiting, but she insisted, took the Reese's out of my hands and paid for it. She explained later that she believes that whenever she does something nice to someone, her son, who is far away in college, will receive some kindness from other people. I was on a train and I had my face buried in a Sudoku when I heard what sounded like sniffling. I turned my head and noticed a young woman standing about five people away from me. Her eyes were carefully hidden behind dark sunglasses and her earbuds were haphazardly placed in her ears. It was apparent that she was struggling to let her emotions draw further attention to her. I noticed another woman tapping her on the shoulder. Moments later, the woman swept her up in a hug and the young woman collapsed her emotions entirely into the hug. After the hug ended, they exchanged words before exiting at the different stops. The young woman's energy was clearly improved, while the other woman didn't think twice about stepping in. Now you guys tell me, who was Jesus in your story? The older woman? The lady in front of the line. The wind and the top ball. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Three different people, three different life stories, and three different images of Jesus. I guess everybody just meets Jesus in their very different, in a very different way, from their very own perspective. There's no stereotypical man with a beard smiling at us. Oh, like, yes, there is. I'm sorry, what? Hold on. Let me tell you my story. I have grown up with the image of sorrowful Jesus, and I think because of that, 
it has been difficult for me to imagine a joyous, loving version of him. Until recently. The Bible speaks often of the wondrous love he has for us, and that has been hard for me to imagine just what that is. Until I saw a YouTube video. Yes, a YouTube video, believe it or not. It was a film of a joyous Jesus playing with children and laughing and smiling. The whole time, there was something about that smile that conveyed that he really enjoys us, revels in us, and truly loves being with us. One morning, on my daily walk, I was looking down on the ground, unaware of what was going on around me. Because as usual, I was caught up in my own world, my own thoughts. But eventually, I did look up and immediately saw coming towards me a bearded man on a bicycle. He slowly rode his bike towards me, but before he passed, he smiled at me. And like the smile in the YouTube video, this smile conveyed a lot to me. I was filled with hope and a reminder that Jesus is always with us if we just look up. And sometimes he's even riding a bicycle. And sometimes he has a beard too. All right, it's a great story. Thank you. I guess beard or no beard doesn't make a difference, right? Important though is that Jesus comes to us and he is present in our lives. What often happens though is we do not recognize him at first. So true. Let me introduce you to our next two guests. This is Cleo and Clopas. They have been best friends all their lives. And, this is important, they have been disciples of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, the one and only. They have an amazing story to tell us. Their story is set after the crucifixion and burial of Jesus Christ. Oh, and, <laughs> um... It was the worst weekend. The, I mean, the whole week had been so weird already. Yes, within a week, we'd witnessed Jesus being welcomed in Jerusalem with palm leaves and praise as the King and Messiah, but then also being nailed to the cross and buried. After that, all we wanted to do was to go home. So they walked home. You have to walk seven miles to get from uh, Jerusalem. How about you let us tell the story? Okay. All right. I'm sorry, you're saved. <laughs> okay, you have to walk seven miles to get to Jerusalem, back to Emmaus. That's where we live. We had just started uh, walking and we were discussing the recent events. Was there something we could have done to stop it? To save Jesus' life? What was this all about? What were we going to do next? We had always thought that he was really the Messiah, the one who was going to save us. And then, out of nowhere, this man comes up behind us. He asks us what we were talking about and we answer him. That Jesus had died and he's our Messiah, our Savior. We also told them that the body was not in the tomb anymore where we had put it. He just looked at us for a long while, and then he started talking. He started at the beginning with the books of Moses and all the way through the prophets, and explained to us how the scripture said that exactly this would happen to the Messiah. It was wonderful. Amazing. We were so startled that we couldn't get one single word out. At nightfall, we reached Emmaus, and we invited the strange man to have dinner with us. We wanted to hear more from him. And as he broke the bread and started to say a prayer, we recognized him. It was Jesus, the resurrected Messiah. We looked at each other. OMG! <laughs> we couldn't believe it. Uh, and as we turned our eyes back to him, he was gone. Vanished. And from that moment on, our lives were never the same anymore. The same night, we ran back to Jerusalem, and on the streets and in the city, we told everybody what we had seen. Jesus Christ is among us for eternity. Sometimes you just got to take a closer look to recognize him, right? Correct. Always remember Jesus' presence in your lives. It gives you power. It gives you courage. It makes you strong through community. And for us, it changed our lives. Thank you. Remembering Jesus' presence in your life, power, courage, strength, community. What are you thinking about, Pastor John? 
<clears throat> a few things. <clears throat> in the Gloria Day Sanctuary, the baptismal font sits in the middle of the aisle. And except for the weeks of Lent, there is uh, water in that basin. We have often taught and encouraged people to touch that water and to make the sign of the cross over themselves as a way of remembering Jesus' presence in their lives. I remember a number of years ago, there was a music rehearsal going on in the sanctuary on a Thursday night. And some of the musicians brought their young children, and they were playing around, playing tag or hide and seek. And a few of them came running into the sanctuary to ask a question of their parents. And then they raced off again out the center doors. There were three of them running. As they got to the center doors, on the way out of the sanctuary, two of them kept going. But the last child came skidding to a stop, turned around, ran back to the font, touched the water, and made the sign of the cross over herself and raced off again. She remembered. Something called her back to remember Jesus. Something stopped her in her tracks, even for a moment, to pause, to remember Jesus' great love for her, before she raced off into life again. I will never forget seeing that moment. I found it moving and joyful. Felt Jesus' presence right there. What does it make you feel to remember Jesus' presence in your life? What does it do for you? Hmm. Hmm. Another story. Last summer, my father-in-law died. Howard was an Air Force veteran, having served in the Korean War. He was many other things, too. He was a butcher, a husband and father, a grandfather and friend, a golfer and a talker, a Christian. As we gathered at the cemetery in rural Iowa, members of the American Legion Post gathered to offer the traditional salute that is given at times like this one. 21 shots to honor the fallen. Some of the children gathered uh, the shells from the grass as a sign of remembrance of him. And one of them walked up and gave me one of those shells. I found that shell in my backpack a couple of weeks ago. As I held it, I was transported to that beautiful June morning last summer when we said goodbye to Howard in the middle of cornfields next to a church. As we mourned and remembered this man that had been so much a part of our lives, as we remembered God's sustaining love present in his life and present to us on that day and all the days since, all because I found a piece of metal in the pocket of my backpack. Does that answer your question? Jesus' presence in my life reminds me that we are all part of a bigger picture. God's children at work. Uh, God at work in the connections of our relationships. Jesus' presence reminding me that I am loved and accepted for who I am, and that in this acceptance, we are all given strength and courage to live as God intends. This is the beauty of this community and all these relationships we've been given. Thank you. You're welcome. Miracle. 
miracles do happen. God caught my daughter in her fall. He caught her. In 2009, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Pastor John wanted to share a yearly prayer with me before my surgery. He asked me what I was most afraid of and what I would like to pray for. I told him that I wanted to pray that the cancer had remained localized and hadn't spread. I also wanted to pray that the surgery went well without complication. I folded my hands and bowed my head. Pastor John put a hand on my left shoulder and began a healing prayer. At this exact moment, I was literally filled with a white light, and I knew that I would be okay. Our one-and-a-half-year-old daughter just got out of bladder surgery, and we were sent down to her recovery area. Of course, we were very nervous parents, praying that she would wake up and be okay. Not only did she come out of the anesthesia, but the first thing she did was to look across the room and point to a number sticker on a piece of medical equipment and declare four, which was indeed the number. We knew God had been with us and the doctors that day and that all would be just fine. For almost two years now, this congregation, all of you, have been a light in my life. When I moved here from Germany, I barely knew anyone. I was still struggling with the language. I was all by myself in a foreign country. And then, you happened. On my way to work one day, I got stopped by that red light over there, which gave me time to read the Bible quote on the outside of this church. It says, He's with us always. God is everywhere. Which seems like a simple statement, right? But at that time it moved me. I came to service the next Sunday and I sat down in one of those back rows, saw all your faces for the first time and heard Pastor John preach. You guys made me feel like one of your own that day and I can't describe how much that meant to me at that time in my life. Jesus gave us in his teaching a direct command. He said to his disciples and followers, you are the light that gives light to the world. Jesus invites us to follow his lead, to seek the light within us, and to share this firework with the world. The stories we've heard today are accounts of that light. They speak of love, of generosity, kindness, comfort, and community. For two years now, you guys have been this light in my life, and I can't describe how grateful I am for that. This, thank you so much for everything. These are good news because they are a testimony of the presence of the risen Savior in our lives. These are good news because it is a testimony of the light that shines on each and every one of us. Jesus told us that we are giving light into the world. And our lights keep shining because the good news of Jesus never ended on the cross. They are being continued by all of us every day. This, this, this is, is our gospel. gospel. These, These are, are good, good news. news.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. 